a very important um, issue to, to be dealt with in quantum computation is error correction. Um, because the quantum states that you prepare and manipulate in the lab in, in a quantum computer are very delicate and they are easily disturbed. And if we want to have any hope of building larger quantum computers that can actually solve uh, reasonable practical problems, useful practical problems, then we need a way to correct errors. And um, the challenge is bigger than in the classical case. If you transmit classical information via a cable, say, and you have noise in the, in the cable, then classically the way you deal with that is that you add redundancy to your signals. There is um, clever algorithms that allow you to add redundancy and do that in the most efficient way possible. Um, and then when some of the bits that you transmit through the channel are disturbed, then at the other, at the receiving end, you can use the redundant information to reconstruct the original information. You would like to do something similar in a quantum computer. So while the qubit basically travels through the circuit, it can be disturbed and you want to add redundancy in some form that allows you to reconstruct the correct quantum state if the qubit was disturbed. However, this is uh, complicated by a number of challenges, challenges which are peculiar to quantum physics and which you don't have in the classical case. The first obstacle is the no cloning theorem. We discussed that you cannot simply copy the state of a qubit. And so the most straightforward way of adding redundancy namely simply copying qubit states and sending them multiple times is ruled out by the no cloning theorem. Another complication arises from the fact that um, measurements generally disturb the quantum state. So if you receive a qubit and you know it may have been disturbed, then um, you cannot simply perform a measurement on the qubit to find out what kind of error possibly may have occurred. Yeah? Or if, say, you, you send uh, redundant qubits and um, then you try to find out what kind of error um, occurred in transit by performing measurements on, on all these qubits. You cannot in general do that without disturbing the states of these qubits and therefore destroying the quantum information that you want to receive. And the final complication comes from the fact that um, while a classical qubit can only be flipped, uh, so noise may cause a bit with the value zero to flip to a bit with the value one and vice versa. In the quantum case, the noise can consist in an arbitrary unitary transformation. And that can be anything. Yeah? So let's say you start out with a basis state zero and um, then the noise effects a random unitary transformation then if you think of the block sphere, you can end up at any point on the block sphere. Yeah? Not just the South Pole, the opposite end, but anywhere on the block sphere. So you have a continuum of possible mistakes. There exist very sophisticated error correction codes, which are able to address all these three challenges. And they can cope with also a, this continuum of um, 
possible errors in particular. I don't want to show you this general algorithm, but I would want to uh, show you the very simplest example, which leaves out some of the complexities that I just mentioned on the previous uh, page. That's called the three qubit bit flip code. So we are talking about a situation where actually we do not have a continuum of possible errors, but we errors, but we have one special type of error only, and that consists in a random flip of basis states. So it's still rather close to the classical case where uh, the basis state zero may be flipped to a basis state one and vice versa. And this may happen with some probability P, which we are assuming to be small. However, we still have to deal with the other two complications that I mentioned on the previous page. So um, that we cannot simply add redundancy by copying qubits, qubit states. And also we have to be very careful with measurement yeah, when we want to detect and correct the error. So these difficulties remain. This um, type of error amounts to a random application of the Pauli X gate. Yeah? If you remember Pauli X, that flips the basis states. So you can imagine uh, the noise to be a random application of the Pauli X gate with some small probability P. Now, the situation we are considering is the following. We have a qubit of interest which is in an arbitrary superposition state Psi. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be a basis state, so an arbitrary superposition state Psi. And we transmit that qubit through a noisy channel. And we want to keep that state intact, despite the noise. So what happens in the noisy channel, we have this random application of the Pauli X gate. And as a consequence, we don't know exactly which state comes out at the other end. The idea of this error correcting code is to use two auxiliary qubits. That's our redundancy yeah, physically. Um, which are both initially in the basis state zero. And in the first step, we couple the qubit of interest via a sequence of two C naughts to these auxiliary qubits. And let me write down what the state of the three qubits looks like after these two initial C naughts. So here's the first part of the circuit again. And for the qubit of interest, I wrote the state Psi explicitly as a superposition state with amplitudes A and B for the basis state zero and one. So here, before the C naughts, the three qubits taken together, they are in the superposition state zero 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 and one zero zero. Yeah, so this is the state of all three qubits. Now what the first C naught does is it flips the state of the second qubit, the basis state of the second qubit, depending on the state of the first qubit. So zero, zero, zero remains intact, but one, zero, zero becomes one, one, zero, yeah? because the control qubit here is in basis state one, and therefore the target qubit, which in this case is the second one, is flipped. So after the first C naught, we have this superposition. And then we just repeat the the same argument, only that the target qubit is now the third qubit. And then 
Here again, nothing happens. And here in the second contribution to the superposition, the third qubit is flipped also. So that at the end of the day, we have a superposition of 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1. And these are now going into the noisy channel. Now, what, is, what does the state of the three qubits look like after the noisy channel? We said we assume that the probability of a random Pauli X is small. The random application of Pauli X applies to each, to all three qubits individually. And we can, we assume that the probability of this happening is so small that it's very unlikely that two or three qubits are disturbed simultaneously. So either none of the qubits are disturbed by the noise, or just one of the qubits is disturbed uh, by the noise. But the probability, say that all three are disturbed, that would be a probability equal to p to the power three. And we say p is so small that this is negligible. And likewise, for two qubits, that would be proportional to p squared. We also say this probability is really small. So we really consider only four possibilities. So either all three qubits exit the noisy channel undisturbed. Then after the channel, we still have the state 0, 0, 0 uh, and 1, 1, 1 as a superposition. Or the error, so the random application of the Pauli X occurred on the first qubit. In that case, the state after the noisy channel would be a superposition of 1, 0, 0 and 0, 1, 1. If the error occurs on the second qubit, it's 0, 1, 0 and 1, 0, 1. Or if the error occurs on the third qubit, it's a superposition of 0, 0, 1 and 1, 1, 0. So what we are assuming here is that the three qubits exit the noisy channel in one of these four states. And then let's see what happens next. Then we perform a measurement. And I said earlier, we have to be very careful with measurements because they may disturb the state. But this measurement is designed such that it will not disturb the state of the three qubits, no matter which of the four states it is. Specifically, this measurement, it's a three qubit measurement. Yeah? So it's performed on all three qubits uh, simultaneously. Yeah? So we are talking about a measurement described in the eight dimensional Hilbert space of three qubits. And you remember from the review of quantum theory that each outcome of a measurement corresponds to a subspace of the Hilbert space. And this is a measurement which has four possible outcomes. Each of the four outcomes corresponds to a two dimensional subspace of the eight dimensional three qubit Hilbert space. And these subspaces, these four subspaces, each of them two dimensional, they are mutually orthogonal and they add up to the entire eight dimensional Hilbert space. The first uh, outcome, possible outcome of the measurement, uh, that's the outcome labeled zero. Um, that corresponds to a subspace spanned by the basis states 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1. And this P 
zero is the projector associated with that um, subspace. The next possible outcome of the measurement is the outcome labeled one, and it corresponds to the subspace of the Hilbert space spanned by the basis states one zero zero and zero one one. And this is the associated projector onto that subspace and so on. If, if you compare this with the four possible states in which the three qubits can emerge from the noise channel, then uh, you see that the first possibility where there was no flip in the channel, no random application of the Pauli X, in, the, in this first case, the three qubits are in a superposition of 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1. And therefore, they lie in this subspace spanned by 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1. And hence, this measurement will give the outcome 0. And since um, before the measurement, the three qubits already lie in the subspace. The measurement will not change that state yeah? because in general, the measurement um, after the measurement, you have to project onto the eigenspace or onto the subspace to which your measurement result corresponds. Um, but this projection has no effect because the state is already in that subspace. In the second possibility, when there was a disturbance on the first qubit, the three qubits emerging from the noisy channel are in this superposition of 1, 0, 0 and 0, 1, 1. Which means that this state lies in the subspace sp uh, spanned by 1, 0, 0 and 0, 1, 1. And therefore in the subspace corresponding to the measurement outcome one. So once again, um, measurement will not change the state of the three qubits because their state already lies in that subspace. And this applies also to, to the two other possibilities. Yeah, so effectively, this measurement here determines whether there was no disturbance at all, that is the outcome zero, and that corresponds to the first subspace, or whether the first qubit was disturbed, this corresponds to the outcome one, or the second qubit was disturbed, this is the outcome two, or the third qubit was disturbed, this is the outcome three. So this measurement is designed in such a way that it can um, detect if a disturbance occurred at all, and if so, on which of the qubits. And this measurement is um, done without disturbing the state. This, such a measurement is called a syndrome measurement, and it measures the so-called error syndrome. Yeah, it's the type of error that occurred, yeah? whether no disturbance at all, or if a disturbance on which of the three qubits. Once we have determined the error syndrome with the help of this measurement, without disturbing the state, we can proceed to correct the error. And this is a stage called the recovery operation. It's a unitary transformation that I apply depending on the outcome of the syndrome measurement. So it's a controlled info, uh, operation. I didn't show explicitly this control in the, in the circuit, yeah, but uh, you, you should keep that in mind. So it's controlled by the outcome of the syndrome measurement. And basically, uh, if the outcome of the syndrome measurement is zero, then I don't do anything. The recovery is the identity. 
if the outcome of the syndrome measurement is one, then I know a Pauli, a Pauli X was applied to the first qubit in the noisy channel. So the recovery consists in applying another Pauli X to the first qubit. And in this way, I undo the error. And likewise, for the two other cases, yeah, when if the outcome is two or three of the syndrome measurement, then I apply Pauli X to the second or the third qubit in my recovery. And I undo the, the, the noisy flip. So this means that after the recovery, the three qubits are again in the same state in which they went into the noisy channel. So after the recovery, they are once again in the superposition of 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1. And then the last step in the circuit consists in applying C knots again. And they're basically, basically they undo the initial C knots. Yeah, so they disentangle. You, you can say the first two C knots at the beginning of the circuit, they created entanglement between the qubit of interest and the two auxiliary qubits. And the two C knots at the end, they disentangle the qubit of interest from the two auxiliary qubits and they lead back to the original state uh, psi for the qubit of interest and the basis state zero for the two others. Maybe just as a, a little outlook, what a more general error correcting code looks like, you can next consider another type of, of error, which is a random flip, but not in the standard basis, but in the plus minus basis, which is, you remember the rotated basis on the, on the block sphere and the standard basis and the plus minus basis, they are related by a Hadamard transformation. And therefore a code which corrects this random flip in the plus minus basis looks very similar to this code. All you have to do, basically, you have to take this uh, code that I just showed you and sandwich it between Hadamard transformations. And then basically the error correction that happens here is transformed to an error correction that does, that corrects random flips in the plus minus basis. So this is another code that uses two auxiliary qubits that corrects that type of error. And then you can make an argument, which I'm not going to present here, that arbitrary errors, meaning arbitrary unitary trans single qubit transformations, can be decomposed into random applications of Pauli X and Pauli Z, which Pauli Z basically does the random flip in the plus minus basis. Therefore, you can show that you can correct arbitrary errors, arbitrary random unitary transformations um, of a single qubit state by a clever combination of these two codes. Yeah, the, this one here, which corrects flips in the standard basis, and the other one, which corrects flips in the plus minus basis. If you, um, if you combine them and build a, com a combined error correcting code that will then require eight auxiliary qubits. And that is capable of correcting arbitrary single qubit errors.